Hello and welcome everybody. In this group of videos we will discuss section 5.2.1 of the book and this section introduces bootstrap sampling and that is a Monte Carlo type technique but one which works from data rather than from simulated samples. So let's see what we got. In the previous videos we have discussed Monte Carlo and Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and the common idea there was that we could estimate an expectation like this as an average of random samples, either IID samples in the case of Monte Carlo estimates or samples generated by a Markov chain for MCMC. But in both cases we had at least approximately that xj have the same distribution as x. That was what the methods were based on. And in this section we are going to discuss methods which require less knowledge about the situation, namely where we can deal with the case if we don't know the distribution of x, but instead we just have some data sampled from x, so we have observed data, but we have no theoretical knowledge on what the distribution of x is. So here we assume that the distribution of x is unknown, so we cannot generate the xj anymore because if we don't know the distribution of x we cannot generate more samples with the same distribution. But instead we have observed data, so we have a sample x1 up to xm. I write from x, by which I mean independent realizations of the random value x. And what we'll see is we will see how we can use this for estimates. So the most naive way would be to take these x1 up to xm in here, but we'll see that one can go a bit further even in this situation. So let us see what we get. The methods we are going to discuss here are called bootstrap estimates. And the general idea behind these methods is that you, instead of the way random samples were generated earlier, instead you generate random samples but randomly picking elements from your data. And before we see what we can do with this, I want to just introduce a bit of mathematical notation to describe this process of randomly picking elements of the observed data. So what do we have? So first thing I want to give you a definition of what's called the empirical distribution of x. This is definition 5.7 in the book and that just says we pick one of the data at random uniformly. So let k be the one we pick. So that's uniformly distributed on the discrete set 1, 2, up to m. m was how many of the x values we have observed. And then we pick the element with index k. So let x star be little x with index capital K. So that means we take our x here, which we take as fixed, but we use a random index to pick one of the lists. So this capital K here is random from here, uniform over all possible indices, but then we plug this into our fixed list of x, so the x is not random, that's why I write lowercase here. And the definition just says the distribution of what we get is called the empirical distribution of x, by which I mean the samples we have observed. And if we need a mathematical symbol, then we write px with a star. So here this little x is the data we have, and that star means we are using the empirical distribution. We could, for example, have a situation where the data we have observed is just four numbers, say 1, 2, 1, 4. And then we can ask what is the empirical distribution of x. And you will see in a second, the main point here is that I have one value observed twice. And when we do the theory, we need to be a bit careful with this case. So what's going on here? So x star is this vector x, and we pick one component at random. And k here is just uniformly distributed on the set 1, 2, 3, 4, because there are four components. So what does this distribution do? It could pick the first element and we get a 1, but we can also get a 1 by picking the third element. So there are two chances of getting a 1. So the probability of x star being equal to 1 is 2 out of 4, which is 1 half. 
and slightly easier the probability of getting a 2 or 4 that is one case each is one quarter each. So that's easy enough and that's the first thing I want to formalize. So let's just see what we just did. The only thing we need to be careful about is if a value is repeated we get it twice. So in general the probability of x star being equal to some value little a is well, first we needed to count how often does the value appear in the list. And we learned this trick, how we can do counting in mathematical notation. Namely, I just go over all elements. I could say m, how many values we have. And then I count 1 every time I get an a. And using our notation, the way we can do that most elegantly is by using an indicator function. So that indicator function is 1 if xi is in this set. But this set has only the element little a and nothing else, so we just count 1 if xi equals a and 0 otherwise. I sum over all candidates, so I get how many of the xi were equal to a. And then I need to multiply with the probability for each k 1 over m. So that's what we just had. The probability of x star being equal to a given value is 1 over m, that's the probability of hitting any of the xi, times times how many of the xi equal a. And that's the general formula for what we just did. And similarly, if we want to ask x star being in a set a, then instead of using the set which just contains little a here, we take the indicator function of the set. So that's pretty straightforward. Now we can work out, say, expectations. So expectation of f of x star we know how we do that, namely expectation is all possible values. So for all a in say x1 to xm, we could get x star equals a and then f of x star equals f of a times then the probability of that happening. So x star equals a and that's what we have just worked out. So that's the sum over all a again in x1 up to xm f of a times, I just plug that in, 1 over m sum i from 1 to m indicator function of a applied to xi. And now we need to put the 1 over m in front and I want to swap the sums. So we have sum i from 1 to m and then sum over all a, I'm leaving out the set here, it's the same as before, f of a indicator function a xi. And I swapped the sums because if you look at that, well, xi can only be one of the possible values. So I use the property here. A set can contain every value only once. So when I summed over all possible values in the previous example, there would be only one term corresponding to one in this example. Because let me just write that here. We have set. 1, 2, 1, 4 equals set 1, 2, 4. A set doesn't keep track of how often you put the elements in. It contains every element, just one. So this set here counts each element only once. That's how expectations go. You do which values can you get, and you will just do it once. And then and this term keeps track of what's the probability of it appearing. Good. So this sum here goes over every element only once. And this indicator function is only true once for this whole sum. So in this sum we get only one term, and that is the term where a equals xi. That's one of the possible values. So this thing equals f of xi, the value we get if a equals xi. And then we get 1 over m sum i from 1 to m f of xi. Now I've just done that a bit slowly because the result looks so super obvious. So we say we pick them at random, then we get just the average. That seems super straightforward, but there is this a bit subtle step that first we have this complication that some values can occur more than once and that shows in here in the probability, so not every element has the same probability. And then we have this extra complication that here in the rule how expectations work. We have to sum over all possible values and every value should only be counted once. So here this sum may have fewer terms 
when there are elements in here. And these two complications just cancel, so in the end we come out as if nothing had happened. And that expression consequently looks a bit more harmless than I think it is. But whatever, it's easy to memorize. So the expectation of f applied to something distributed according to the empirical distribution is just the average of f of xi when xi goes over all the data we have. So duplicates would be counted twice here. Good, so let's just try that out in the example. So example continued. I said so x was 1, 2, 1, 4. And then we get expectation of x star, say I leave out the f and just say f of x is x, would be following this rule, just the average of the xi, left of the x. So that would be 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 4 over 4, and that's, I think, 2. Similarly, we can do expectation of x star squared. Now f of x would be x squared. Then we need to take the average of a function applied to xi, so that would be xi squared. So we could 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared plus 4 squared over 4. And that is 1 plus 4 plus 1 plus 16 over 4. And that is 22 over 4, which I think is 5.5. From that, we can, for example, work out the variance of x star. Variance of x star is expectation of x star squared minus expectation of x star squared. And in this example, we got 5.5 minus 2 squared is 1.5. So that's easy enough. So with what we have learned here, we are now in a position to start considering bootstrap estimates. And the first thing to do in the next video will be to put in the actual data. So see you in the next video.